So I would like to welcome Jan McNeilan, who is a retired OSU Horticulture Extension Agent, a professor at OHA, um, OSU um, Horticulture Department. And um, I want to point out that Jan um, has the most gorgeous garden, he has the green thumb, and um, you could find a lot of information from Jan on the Garden Time TV show that she often can be found on on Saturday mornings. You can find that on your local channel. <clears throat> and um, Jan also offers us a Gardening Tips Facebook page. So you can find her at PNW Garden Tips. So we welcome Jan, who is one of our Positive Charge PDX angels. And I'm looking forward to hearing all about Spring Gardening 101. Well, we'll see. Here we go. Uh, how many of you happen to have the printed outline? Okay, that helps a little. I have the outline, but it's not printed. It's just right here on my iPad. There you go. All right. Um, uh, I would like, to, where's Christy? Is you guys going to share back and forth? No, no, she is in and out. She has got, okay. got other it. things going on today. Um, you guys that are volunteering through Positive Charge know each other better, but uh, this is Carol Couch. She's a oh. mother of um, one of my son's high school girlfriends, and uh, uh, we got to know each other well over the years. And Christy lived with my daughter and I for a year, her daughter, and she's evidently in and out too. And Sally Nowak is here. Um, she's a master gardener from Lincoln County. Uh, is very involved in the garden club there and as a teacher with Master Gardener program and one of my best friends. So she said she was just going to mute herself and stay back in the background, but I will ask her questions when I need to. Um, the first thing is that I put on the outline is that gardening isn't rocket science. It's just fun and rewarding. I used to plant um, radishes every year in the vegetable garden, not because I like radishes, I don't like radishes, but they came up first and I was so excited every time they popped out of the ground. My husband liked radishes, help, hopefully, um, but uh, it's just watching something grow that you are the one who's responsible for that is a, is a lot of fun for those of us who are interested in, in gardening. Um, my advice to any gardener is to not take yourself too seriously, not worry about it. Plants survive us, and if they don't, that's what nurseries are for. And um, so you can, um, you can learn and you can experiment. And let's say one, I've got three tomato plants and I'm gonna plant one in a black bucket, I'm gonna plant one in the ground, and I'm gonna plant one in a raised bed and see how they do. I mean, you might as well, make a little experiment out of some of the things that you're going to do. Um, if you worry about disease and insects and, oh, it's going to die from something, normally when you have trouble with a plant, it's because of its environment, meaning you haven't watered it enough, you've got it in the wrong place. Uh, so there's a lot of different things to consider and not, don't jump to um, uh, pesticides. Um, if it's needed, you'll find out and get a diagnosis that is correct, so you know what to do. I mean, I have people used to, I've been retired 15 years now, so uh, I don't get those phone calls anymore, but um, I have aphids on my roses, should I use a fungicide? Well, no, it's not an insecticide, so you don't need that. So make sure that you know what the problem is before you decide to treat, and all the homemade remedies that uh, you hear about mixing this and that can be more toxic than the things that you buy in the garden centers. So just know what you're doing and how you're going to do it. If you're brand new to gardening and you don't, um, and you don't even know where to start, uh, I would just say, um, what is your exposure? You have a lot of sun, you have a lot of shade, Vegetables aren't going to do very well in the shade, but they have to be mostly in the sun. I have about six hours of sun in my back. I have 17 raised beds, 
and um, they're all pretty much exposed to sun and some of them aren't uh, all day so those are the ones that I'll plant in lettuce or spinach or something leafy that doesn't need quite as much sun as say a tomato plant does. Um, where's the water? Are you going to haul it in from somewhere or do you have a spigot next to it? Make sure that you locate your garden uh, in a place that you can get water to it easily. Um, I have those those snake-like hoses that retract in their cloth and lightweight and so easy to work with. Um, so even if I have if I have a uh, spigot that's not close to what I need, I can screw on a hundred foot uh, one of those hoses and uh, make it to pretty much wherever I want to be with it. You can, <clears throat> if you're in a condo or an apartment, you might only have a balcony or you can plant everything, apple trees in a big bucket and still be okay, as long as it has drain holes in it. Um, I have bought, last summer I bought two uh, columnar apples and they only get to be about five feet tall. And both of them right now are blooming like crazy. And so I'm expecting to get some apples uh, from, from both of them. Um, let's see, what else do we do? Containers, raised beds, both containers and raised beds, um, they dry out faster than something that's in the ground. So consider that too. Also, plastic pots hold water better than clay pots actually breathe and they need to be watered a little more often. We'll talk about how and when you, uh, you do that. Uh, just make sure you can use a five gallon bucket from Home Depot and plant a tomato in it as long as you've poked a bunch of holes in the bottom. The other thing, another myth actually, is that people think you need to put rocks in the bottom of a container or uh, the styrofoam peanuts or something, and you really don't. It's better to have soil all the way to the bottom of the, of the bucket so that, or the container so that it actually drains well and doesn't make a bunch of water at the bottom. Um, all of us see other people's yards, other people's plants, and say, I, you know, what is that? I want that. Okay, well, if you see something and, and you're able to identify it, uh, wherever it is you've seen it, figure out is it where its exposure is. Is it south facing? Is it east? Is it sun? Is it shade? And so that you know if you have the environment that that particular plant will grow in. So you need to choose your plants based on what your um, what what your situation is, whether or not it's full sun, shade, or a combination thereof. Um, the zone on a plant. Let's see where have I got this. Um, the zone on a plant where it will grow um, is a USDA zone, um, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and on got a tomato tag here. Um, it'll tell you what zone this particular plant will grow in. And the nurseries love to put out stuff, bougainvillea and, and all sorts of other things that don't grow here. If you want it, that's fine, but treat it as an annual because we don't, we're not warm enough. Um, so, and that, like I say, that that doesn't mean you can't try. Like I, I try to grow Rugmansia, which is an angel trumpet and has a flower, a long tubular trumpet shaped flower that's very fragrant. They come in an orangey, pink, white. Um, and they're really not, they're sold a lot in the nurseries, but they're really not meant to grow here. So I've had them come back from the ground uh, every year uh, most years, but this last last year was a little colder than the others. I mulch it a lot um, in the fall and hope for the best. And that's what you can do with some uh, with some plants. Our zone here, at least here in the Willamette Valley, is 8B, and there's it's broken down in two different ways. You can go on Google, look up, up a USDA. Uh, zone map for Oregon or for Portland or whatever and you'll see what um, what the zone is for you. Um, we're HB and that is 
um, the temperatures that are on the labels on the letters are the temperature in which a plant will survive not necessarily look great but it'll live to that low a temperature so 8b is um 15 to 20 degrees so that's here in portland that plant that says 8b or seven or six you can go down but you can't go up you can't go like to nine here because those plants won't, won't do well um, so here um, at the coast for sally sally you tell me if i'm wrong or not is a 9a is that 9a for you guys mostly southern coast not us central southern, coast. for like brookings and gold right. beach central coast we're more i usually tell people 7b to 8b right and, right. and it just depends because we don't get the heat yeah which that's, is a whole nother situation yeah. Well, and you guys are close enough to the water that you get that marine moisture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Well, and also you need to know, and on the back of, let's, this is a vegetable um, packet of Swiss chard. It will say on the, on the packet what the soil temperature has to be for it to germinate and live. It tells you when to plant it, and it tells you that's on flower packets or anything like that. It tells you when to plant it. Um, and it has uh, the soil temperature it needs to be. So for Swiss chard, the soil temperature that's on this packet, hello, there it is, <laughs> is uh, 50 to 80 degrees soil temperature. So uh, uh, if you're gonna, especially if you're gonna plant with seeds, an inexpensive soil thermometer is a good thing to have because on those spring days, well, not so much in spring, but in February, we usually have sort of a false gorgeous week uh, and you're tempted to run out and it's in the nurseries for you to buy, get some marigolds and some petunias and no, it's too soon to plant those, even though like right now, it's kind of edgy for, um, for tomatoes even right now. It's still cool in the evening. I was at Fred Meyer's Garden Center yesterday and found um, that all of their displays had protect annuals uh, un um, from frost. So in other words, there's so many microclimates that the zone for, um, for Portland is, is literally at 160 feet. Well, I'm in Southwest Portland, it's 600 feet. So we'll get snow long before anybody else at the lower elevations does. So maybe if you have a protected balcony in downtown Portland, your petunias might make it, but it's, they count on that uh, for everybody to get so excited about gardening that um, they uh, buy stuff and then, because the, the, the soil is too cold to take up the phosphorus it needs for roots, they'll sit there and turn purple. And I've had a lot of purple marigolds in my lifetime <laughs> where you just, you know, you can't help it. You want, you're ready. You're so ready. But it does help to know at least a few uh, hints uh, to help that. Our last frost date here in Portland is March 11th. And the first frost date is November 22nd. That's according to NOAA weather uh, forecasting. And, um, but that changes, you know, this climate change or whatever, everything's a little different every year. So you just have to kind of use your noggin and figure it out. Um, I was men I mentioned that um, putting things out too early, they'll either just not grow uh, or they will turn usually purple or die from rot if it, there's too much, uh, too much weather. Um, how many of you know what bald and burlap is? Okay. Um, bald and burlap is when you're going to buy a tree or you're going to buy a large shrub, an evergreen shrub, where they wrap the burlap around the root ball. One thing that happens with that is that often people don't cut the string that's holding that burlap on. And yes, the plant does fine for a year or two, 
and then begins to die and you can't figure out why. Well, the tree or shrub is growing and that string is uh, around the trunk is literally cutting off the circulation of the plant. So if you get something that's bald and burlap, just make sure that when you plant it, and there's theories about whether you should take it completely off, if you should cut it down around the edges of the root ball, um, it depends really. First of all, if it's the kind of uh, burlap that rots, you're okay. Um, and then sometimes the soil in that root ball isn't really hard enough or clay enough to hold together if you took it off. So I kind of like to do it halfway. I take it off the trunk, cut the, the cut the burlap around and pull it down over the shoulders of the root ball and let it go from there and remove the extra burlap and set it down so that you don't aren't disturbing that root ball when you when you plant it. Um, you'll also find this time of year less and less as it gets warmer but you'll find bare root plants, bare root roses, bare root fruit trees, bare root shade trees, whatever. Um, when you do plant a bare root plant, put it in a bucket of water and let it soak for about an hour or so at least uh, so that you can get that plant in there and not have it dry out in the soil that you're putting it in. So you want to hydrate those roots the best, um, best that you can. And the other next thing is um, you'll end up with two and three and five gallon buckets cans um, and the price goes up with each one. But just know that here, here we're just so lucky here because you can buy a gallon can of a rhododendron and a five gallon can and, and the price is considerably different. Um, and, but the way things grow here, have you noticed? Uh, there, uh, that, that five gallon can you could get the one gallon instead, put it in, and it's going to catch up with that five gallon can in, in most cases. So um, keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that plants that are on sale, um, there's a reason they're on sale. And it's a, a lot of times maybe those plants are root bound in the container. So I, rec oh, I, have, I have a hummingbird that has decided to visit me in the window of my office and <laughs> she's all over there. Um, if, uh, let's see, the gallon cans um, and if they're root bound and on sale, uh, pull it out of the can if you can and take a look at the roots. If the roots are going in circles in that pot, then it's been in that pot a long time and you, um, you just need to treat it a little more special than you do any other plant that isn't circling the, the pot. So when you take it out of the pot, you pull the roots apart. Um, you can use a, a knife. Plants aren't, don't cry. They just sit there. And so just um, go down the sides of the, of the root ball uh, and or splay it out. And it's like you butterfly it. So you literally take a shovel, lay the plant on its side, take a shovel and go not clear up to the to the where the root is at the, the soil surface, but take the shovel and literally halfway up, say, let's do it that way, halfway up, take that shovel and cut it in half and then pull that, pull those apart. And when you, in the planting hole, we'll talk about that in a minute, put some soil underneath where you've pulled it apart so it has contact. And you can get away with that and get some good plants on sale as long as you know uh, what to do when you get them there. Um, four inch pots, you know, we get these little, little annuals and stuff in four inch pots. That too, screw, be rough with it. Just take it, pull it apart, scratch it so that the roots are going to go in all different directions. Um, you don't, you don't want to completely take all the soil off of it at all. You just want to scratch it enough that it's going to be a contact uh, with the soil. And then the other thing is that I always recommend, and a lot of times new plants that you've put in, um, the nursery says to water them. Okay, I'm going to go home, going to plant it, 
dig it, dig the hole and water it. And then I don't think about it the rest of the summer and into the fall. And you're losing those plants and not in saying, I, but I watered it. Well, here, here's the way to start. Um, dig the hole, whatever it is, four inch pot, gallon can, five gallon can, whatever. Twice as wide as what the root ball is, that goes for everything. And just as deep, what you don't wanna do is plant a plant in loose soil that, um, that is, uh, then it starts to sink and then soil gets around the stems that are right at the, at the level of the pot and, um, and, and you may lose a plant, especially a tree that's too deep. So when you're done, uh, it should be right at the same level it was when it was in the pot. Um, what you do is, again, twice as wide and as deep. And pretty much, except for the rainiest part of the spring, I always mud in plants. So I dig the hole, I put a, a hose in the hole and fill the thing with water. And so that means when you put the new plant in the hole and backfill the soil, you are going to not have air, a lot of air around the roots. You're gonna make sure that it, the soil settles uh, and the plant gets a good start. Most well, all nurseries will tell you you need fertilizer and you need potting mix and you need compost and you need all these things. Um, most of the time it doesn't hurt it, but with the clay soils, I have really hard pan clay here. If you dig a hole and, and you put potting mix or compost in it, and then you put thinking that this is great because this plant's gonna love it, you've actually made a pot for the plant and it's gonna fill with water and not have anywhere to go. So if you have nice uh, clay soil and you've got that pot or that level right where you want it, and if you backfill it with foreign soil per se, um, it's not gonna do as well if you have clay. But like, you know, out in Canby, um, in the valley, it's gorgeous soil and it, that's not a problem to have clay, but knowing what you have helps. Um, so you, you can, sure, you can put some compost in. You don't really want um, to put a lot of fertilizer in when you first plant because those roots are tender and you might burn some of the, some of the roots. So page two. Um, how do you choose the plants? Just, well, with me, I, I buy what I like and what I look at, and then I go home and try to figure out where I'm gonna put it. And so that's, my husband used to say that I used the wheelbarrow as a container garden, because I was always moving things around. And I saw a quote once that, that said, um, the garden is always, can always be perfect when you, move that last rose bush in the place that you have to have it and then but the, you know you'll end up finding something else that has that you, isn't doing well and has to move so there's annuals there's perennials and there's biennials and evergreens and deciduous trees uh, so an annual is a plant that is literally only one season like petunias like marigolds like you know the the, the typical um plants that are you find in uh, hanging baskets, etc. Um, a perennial is one that takes, that will die back down usually, uh, and you need to do some pruning in the fall on it, uh, or, and, and it will last season after season, depending on if it likes it there. Um, but a biennial is like foxglove, that it flowers one year, goes to seed, and then the next year it's kind of a rosette small plant and then that year it'll flower again. So it takes an, a full growing, um, two complete seasons uh, to cycle. Mulch, depending, I have an acre here. So what's behind me in these two gardens, this one is a rose garden and this one is a grass garden. Um, I usually mulch about every few years, it's just, 
I would do it every year, except it's too dang expensive. Um, and so you just have to scratch it up and keep the weeds out the best you can in between. Um, it, it is expensive, but it keeps, it keeps soil, retains soil moisture, keeps the weeds down. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a good thing to, to use mulch when you can. And then I use extra mulch in the fall. All the leaves that fall off the deciduous trees that I have here, um, we, I just keep blowing up. My neighbor actually came over thinking, a new neighbor, thinking he was helping me and he blew the, the leaves all into a pile in the street. And I went out and went, what? Blow them the other way. <laughs> And so he blew them back into the driveway and I have a south facing garage wall that I put um, all my pots and everything that I want to winter over against that wall and then we blow those leaves on top and they just sit there and, and a lot of things uh, do very well. I plant most of my bulbs in pots and they did fine this year. Uh, so um, that's one way I use sort of a weird mulch but I blow the leaves into the garden beds, not out of the garden beds and let that, I've always wondered why people compost their leaves and then bring them back to the place where they raked them out of in the first place. So um, usually that's uh, what I do. Uh, best time to water when you have time, not just in the morning. Yes, in the morning it's nice, but what if you can't do it? You, you, you don't need to think that, um, that, oh no, I have to get up early and water before, you know, the sun comes up. And yes, you can get some burning on, on tender leaves with water and sun reflection. But in the, in the big picture, you water when you can. And so uh, that takes some of the worry um, out of it. Um, when you're watering pots, keep in mind that when a when a plant is in the ground and you've done fertilizer, that fertilizer stays there longer around that plant. But if you've got pots, uh, you need to, f if, if you fertilize like nurseries do once a week with fertilizer, that's why they look so lush and wonderful. And we bring them home and once every month we think maybe we should put some fertilizer on them and that's why they don't look as good. Um, and keep in mind that when you water, it leaches out all that fertilizer that you put in. So that's why you need to keep repeating that if you want um, lots of compliments and lush uh, baskets. So do it slowly um, and so that, because sometimes there'll be so much soil in the pot that the water will run right off the top. So you want to do it slow enough that it penetrates and eventually drains from, you can, drains the pot and it's running out of the bottom and that's what you want to have happen. And there's no, there's no amount of time or water or anything because each one is a little different, the soil is a little different. Um, so you're the one who judges whether or not you've got enough water on that particular plant. We have, uh, so if you're going to fertilize and you can fertilize in ground plants or pots or mulches, or I mean, um, raised beds or whatever, this is, let's see there, it's backwards, but it's there. This is Osmocote. Osmocote is a fertilizer that is, that is, uh, pearled or covered, uh, with a, 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 with a coating that when it gets wet, it lets go of some of its fertilizer. Sometimes you'll see uh, little tiny beads, little tiny marbles as such, tiny, tiny, um, in pots that, and sometimes they're green, sometimes orange, brown, whatever. Um, you'll see them in pots that you buy from the nursery. And that's because Osmocote is a better thing for them to use because they're not mixing liquid. They can put it on every time they water, it releases some fertilizer. And so that's one thing. Sometimes people think that they have slug eggs in their pots when indeed it's most likely, um, it's most likely the Osmocote. So here's, here's another thing. It's, sort of confusing for a lot of people to um, 
know what nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are, and how much should I use, and what kind of fertilizer is that? Is that for tomatoes, or is that for lettuce, or is that for geraniums, or what? So here's, here's one fairly easy thing to remember. It's NPK. N is nitrogen, P is phosphorus, and K is potassium, or potash. So N is for the top, P is for the bottom, and K is for all around. Up, down, all around. The nitrogen is for leafy plants, and all plants need nitrogen. But I had, actually last fall when we did this class, um, somebody said something about, I used to grow, and I don't think she's here, um, I used to grow tomatoes on a balcony in New York or something. She said, I just had beautiful plants, beautiful plants, but I never got hardly any tomatoes. And it's like, okay, well, you know what you might have done? You might have had a fertilizer that was very high in nitrogen and maybe lower in the other two, but at least high nitrogen. And all it's going to do is tell that plant to grow leaves, not flowers, not fruit. So um, my guess is that's what happened because she said that her plants were very healthy. So N is for the top uh, and for and. P is for the roots, and K is for all-around health. Um, let's see, I had a, somewhere here, if I can hold it still enough. Let's see, where's the game? <laughs> this may not work. Nope. Well, there, there we are. I don't know if I'm going to hold it still enough. Well, next time I do this, I'm going to have slides that I can show you. Um, nitrogen greens up the plant. If a plant is yellow, the leaves are yellow and you know they're supposed to be green, it probably needs nitrogen. Um, just think up for nitrogen for the leaves. Phosphorus reaches down and helps the roots, the root growth. So when I plant my um, tomatoes, I use some phosphorus in the bottom. I plant them, this is an exception to the planting rule. I dig a hole as deep as I can and leave as little as I can above the ground um, because the stem of a root uh, of a tomato plant will will sprout roots when it's underground. So you can plant it as deep as you want. Just make sure you got some leaves left at the top. Um, and then I put in calcium um, because the regular fertilizers don't have, it might have some micronutrients in it, but not enough. Um, and calcium in the bottom uh, to keep the plants. What happens is if there's not enough calcium in the soil, the plant itself, the fruit will extract calcium literally from the fruit and you'll have what's called blossom end rot where the bottom of the tomato is black. Uh, you can keep that from happening by using the potassium uh, uh, or the phosphorus and some um, calcium. Uh, the pot potash actually, or potassium, actually um, promotes healthy plants' well-being. So, um, so if you've used, uh, let's see, if you have a, a plant that fruits, uh, you don't want to use a number let's see, that's high, like, I think this one will work. Mm -hmm. Boy, I did it before and it worked fine. No, oh, nope. Well, this all-purpose um, fertilizer is called Jax, and a lot of nurseries use it. A lot of nurseries use it. And it's water-soluble, and it's 20-20-20. In other words, 20% by of nitrogen, 20% of phosphorus and 20% potassium. Now, if I put this on, say my, um, let's see, on my tomatoes, it's going to go, it's going to leaf more and not have as much fruit. But there's another kind of jacks that's 10, 20, 20. So what does that mean? That 10 is the nitrogen, so it's lower. So 
if you want the high nitrogen, I could use the 20, that's the number for nitrogen, on my spinach or anything or my herbs that you're just not looking for fruit, but you're trying to make the leaves uh, grow better. So there's also an, in a lot of places, there's um, triple 16 is the easiest thing to find and you can use it that way. Uh, but um, if you can get the 5, 10, 10 or 10, 20, 20, you want that first number to be lower for things that you want to flower or to fruit. Um, so that, that should help a little bit. Uh, there's all these special boxes. Oh, thank you. How did you do that? Not fair. <laughs> The, um, I, I appreciate it, whoever did it. Um, anyway, um, there's special tomato food, special rhododendron food, special orchid food, special everything. But if you know those, those numbers and what they mean and what you're trying to do, uh, then, um, then you're gonna be ahead of it and not have to buy the special food because it's all the same. And then there's organic and there's synthetic. Organic uh, fertilizers uh, are slow release, slow to break down, last longer, actually um, uh, improve soil health and a lot of other things that are, are good. Synthetics are not necessarily quote chemical synthetics. They're often made from the same minerals that the organics are. Uh, and the, the difference too is that organic fertilizers cost about twice as much as the synthetics do. So it's up to your budget uh, and, and your uh, take on the environment, um, what you might wanna do. When fertilizing, say your pots or your hanging baskets or whatever, water first, then fertilize with liquid fertilizer. Because if that plant is dry to start with and then you're gonna fertilize, uh, you, you may be burning the roots with the fertilizer. So water first, it could be the day before, whatever, just you don't want your pots to be dry uh, when you actually uh, fertilize. A garden is, is a real experiment, as we said before. I mean, I had a lady in a class one time, we were talking about lawn fleas that were in, in her lawn. And she said that Jerry Baker, who is a wacko guy, said to mix coke and what was it? Ammonia and something and spray your lawn. And she said, I didn't have any fleas at all. It worked. And I said, well, I didn't have any fleas either. And I didn't spray at all because that wasn't a year that we were gonna have fleas. Uh, so be careful of the, of the homemade remedies that are out there and do some research and make sure that it's, it's safe enough to do. I do make my own insecticidal soap with just water and some dish soap in it. And I, I, the percentage is very low with the soap and I use it in the greenhouse uh, mostly. Um, right now I've got uh, two flowering maples in the, which is really a shrub um, in the greenhouse and they're like aphid magnets. So um, I've been using those and I'm not even rinsing it off afterwards um, because it's, it seems to work, but it's not gonna burn the leaves. Um, I also have, thanks to Sally, I have a, um, <laughs> a Meyer lemon um, that S Sally's got one at home and gave me one and it had scale and I was like, oh boy. And so I didn't want to bother with it. And then I, I actually put it out, Sally knows this. So I actually put it outside for the winter, hoping it would die and it didn't. It actually liked it really well. And I put it in the corner by the garage. So it was south facing uh, during the winter. And so it was warm enough to survive. So, and then I had it out by the end of the greenhouse and I had some friends over here and uh, Sace, um, he owns the Lily Market, which is a Asian market in Southeast Portland. Uh, he, he's a gardener, he 
he grows everything tropical. And anyway, he bent down and he said, wow, that's a lot of, that lemon has a lot of scale. And it's like, it does? I never wear my glasses when I go out to garden. I just go out and garden. I don't need to unless I'm going to read a seed packet. So I didn't know it even had scale on it until I put my glasses on. And then I used uh, some alcohol and uh, scrubbed the underside of the leaf, got rid of it, started using insecticidal soap, making sure that it got under the leaves where the scale, it, when a scale insect is maturing, it's got a like a waxy cap over the eggs. And um, then any spray you use really doesn't do anything. Uh, so I had to wait until the crawlers were hatching and then I could get those with the insecticidal soap. Um, so <laughs> it, it helped. But, and now I got six lemons off of it this year and I, it's blooming like crazy right now. So I don't know, um, but I, it's become sort of a, a, a badge of honor to keep the thing living. And, uh, and so I have people on garden time asking me, um, how's the lemon doing? So I, I've used it. We thought we'd auction it off somewhere, some garden time activity, but we, right now it's looking so good, I don't think I will. Um, here's some, I, this is gonna work either. There, it's one of those little photo albums that I was given with my grandkids' pictures in it, but it works really well uh, for uh, empty, empty seed packets. Okay. You, you guys that weren't here first don't know that my webcam, when I put it on the way it's supposed to go on the screen, uh, top of the monitor, um, it had me upside down. So I don't know why. I'll figure it out after we're done. So I've got my webcam taped with everything I could think of to turn it over upside down. So that's where it is. So I'm not sure where it's going to. Uh, yeah, well, I, I should give up on this, I think. Anyway, in a photo album, you can keep your plant tags, old seed packets. I used to keep them in a pile or um, the old CD-ROMs that we had years ago, those uh, fi file uh, cases work well for putting in plant tags and you can find those for nothing somewhere. Uh, probably a lot of them are here and there. Anyway, um, so I put plant tags in there and I put uh, seed, empty seed packets because someone's likely to show, say, what's that? And I'll go, I don't know. Um, so I can go in and look. Uh, and see what it was I bought last year. And I know what it looks like and that I like it and it is doing well, but I'm not necessarily gonna know its name. Um, the reason is as an extension agent, um, I didn't have to identify plants as much as I did help people know what was wrong with them and what they could do. And you don't necessarily have to know what it is to know what's wrong with it. But that's a, another hint that uh, works pretty well. Um, I used to, I don't do it anymore, but I used to keep a journal of when I planted seeds in the greenhouse, you know, when I, when I brought them outside, when I transplanted all that. Um, I don't, the notebook that that stuff was in is sort of warped in the greenhouse right now, but, um, there's a lot of resources. If you have, um, if you have the printout that I, uh, put in, I have my, um, uh, Facebook page, it's Jan's PNW Gardening, Garden Tips, and um, I've been doing uh, sort of tips, what to do in the garden kind of thing, segments once a month for the last 20 years with, uh, Garden Time's been on 17 years, but before that we had, I did work with Mike Darcy and uh, Mallory Gwynn on the same kind of show. It's usually, it started on Channel 12, we ended up at six, we ended up on, and I ended up on channel two with Mike, um, but Garden Time is a wealth of information. They have a website, you can look at 
the arc, it'll tell you what's on every show. It's literally archived for 15 years and you can see uh, what's there. If there's something in particular that you want to know about dividing hostas or growing iris or whatever it is, there'll be something there uh, for you. My tips are all archived as well and they've been on there a long time. So the website, uh, you can also go on the website and sign up for the free uh, online magazine. And it's, it's really a great way to learn more about specific uh, subjects. Then uh, I've also put a link on here to the extension service here in the Metro Portland area and to the statewide program. And then there's also another link there that's uh, the 10 minute university, which I helped them start. Uh, we finally got it trademarked um, that the Clackamas County Master Gardeners are doing. And they have an amazing number of handouts on specific subjects that you might want to take a look at. There's videos and there's also uh, handouts. And these are some of the cream of the crop master gardeners that have done these, have written all of these and they're very accurate. Uh, so that helps. No, not too many myths anyway. And then they also have online classes that you can take and they're also free and you can just sign up to learn how to grow peonies or how to grow grapes or whatever. Um, then there's also a link to OSU Extension Publications. And there's a, there again, you go on the Extension Publications website, click on gardening, and there's a, again a, a host of things uh, that you might want to look at. There's also a lot of ag things where farmer for viticulture, for grapes and berries and all sorts of things um, that are more than you're going to want to do, but you can pick through and find a whole lot of stuff. Also, there's a, a link called Ask the Expert, and you can have a problem with a plant. You can ask the question. You can even upload a photograph if something's wrong um, there and at least get within 48 hours, you'll get a, uh, um, an explanation of what they think is the issue and what to do about it. Um, so that should help. I think I'm ready for questions if you have any. Come on, you guys. I got I do. I have a question. Un unmute you. <laughs> Hi, Judy. How did you find it? How did oh, you find me? Just well, pretty amazing. This is my young sister-in-law. There she be. Haven't seen her in ages. Okay, Carol, what's your question? <laughs> my question uh, is back to the uh, mulch place and planting. So planting a new... Um, well, it doesn't matter. We have hostas right now that we're looking at planting. So is it a good idea, as you said, not to use the gravel, but is it a good idea to put some mulch in before you put your potting soil and the plant in the hole? In the hole, not a pot, right? Well, no, in our case, pots, yeah. Pots. No, you just want to use the potting soil that you purchase. Just that's all. You okay. put the potting so well, put some of the potting soil in the bottom, take okay. the hosta out of the can, right. scratch the roots, roots a little bit, backfill the sides and water it well and make sure that it's uh, that you actually that it gets wet. Yeah. And sometimes if it's dry potting soil, you may want to wet it first and then put it in the pot because then okay. your uh, the one you're going to plant is going to do better. Okay, is there an issue with putting mulch in first? Well, in a way, because it depends on the, the, the size of the mulch. I mean, if it's big chips of something. It, it's you not don't, big chips. No. Are you just trying to get rid of mulch? Or? <laughs> no, I bought it thinking it was bark chips, uh, like pine, pine uh, chips. Because of a hint that's, uh, that a gardener person had shared with me. And I thought that's what I bought. And then when I get it home, it says mulch. And I think, oh, shoot. 
Well, that's okay. Do everything with your potting soil, plant the plant, and then just use the mulch that you have on the top of the pots that you have. Okay. So it'll look nice and it'll keep uh, soil retention, okay. soil and moisture retention. Okay. I had a question, Jan. Um, regarding root bound pots. Yeah. If you find that you've purchased something that um, is root bound or like, for example, I was trying to follow your uh, fall advice and do some work with my indoor plants in, um, you know, through the winter. And um, a lot of my indoor plants were really root bound. So my question is, what about cutting the roots? Um, oh, of some, so um, instead of like, if you don't have the room to splay out and you're going to put it back into a pot should you cut off certain you know a certain amount of the roots is it going to be damaging to the plants to do that well it depends on how big that root ball is but uh, if, a lot of times when you've got a root bound container plant um, the root can come right out the drain hole <laughs> and so you just cut it off and scratch it up and yes you can use like a linoleum knife or a box cutter or something and go down and say like three times you don't want to do it every other inch but uh, just enough to to break that uh, loose one thing though depending on what it is you're transplanting is that um, uh, some plants bloom better when they're pot bound oh, so you don't necessarily have to do it look it up and see uh, google is your friend so um, look it up and see, see if, if it does better. I know I, I grow streptocarpus. They're a, a, a violet relative. And they do better when there's like seven plants trying to grow in one pot. But they will flower a little harder. I, part of it is, is just sort of the instinct of the plant that says, oh my gosh, we, are, we're, we must be on our way out. I can't feel my feet so to speak, and, um, and then they'll bloom. So then that happens. Um, I was talking on my Facebook page for um, uh, about rhubarb blooming uh, when it's not supposed to, it's bolting. And it's just that that's what it thinks when we've had some warm weather like we have this spring, that thinks the season's over, I got a flower. Um, so, um, my husband, Ray, uh, used to say, say to people, if you couldn't get your rhododendron to bloom, um, get your shovel and go around it like you're going to dig it up, but don't, and then it'll bloom because it thinks it's the end. Um, so uh, a lot of things are like that. It, sometimes when we think we're doing a, a favor for a plant, uh, it really likes to be a little tighter uh, in that pot. I had a, um, I had a, uh, let's see, a Hinoki cypress that I was, that I planted in a pot and it put it on both sides of the arbor and it was really looked great except I left it there for years and years and I figured I had to uh, break the pot to, if I was going to save the plant and as it turned out, um, I, we watered it heavily and we were able to dig it out of there without wrecking the pot. Judy, you have a question? I do. You know, it used to be that French digging or double digging was recommended for soils and be able to amend things. Sorry for that clock in the background. I will move away. Um, and now sort of there's this evolution in soil stuff for veggie gardens to say, you know, don't disturb the microorganisms in the soil. But how do you amend a clay soil so that little tiny roots from a veggie plant can, can take hold? I mean, where's the balance? Well, I have a whole bunch of raised beds in the back and I did, this year I turned them over because some, year after year after year, they actually get so compact that, that it doesn't work very well. Also, I have mice in the raised beds that like to tunnel through there. And I had a tomato plant last year that 
just looked horrible. And I was like, what? I'm watering, I'm doing everything right. And then I stuck the hose down in and, and it went like whoop over to down a whole mouse run. So it wasn't that they were eating the plants, but they were tunneling, uh, which in a, in a way it's good because you can turn that soil over and um, they made, they got some air to the, to the soil. Um, I don't think you need to worry about it as much as uh, think about what you're planting, what vegetables you're planting, how deep the roots go. Like if you're planting corn, it's one thing. And if you're planting lettuce, it's another, as far as how deep that's going to go. Um, I don't think disturbing the soil once every few years by turning it hurts it at all. And what I do is I put leaf mulch and everything I can on top of where those vegetables will go the following year. And what you're doing then is adding organic matter and breaking down your soil uh, all by itself. So you should be able to scratch up a surface enough for the roots of whatever you're planting. That help any? <laughs> I have another question if no one else does. <laughs> um, my question is about raspberry, a raspberry stand. Um, I actually built two raised beds right near my raspberry stands. And now my raised beds have tons and tons of raspberry starts coming up in them. <laughs> like, um, I'm just wondering how I get rid of, like, am I just going to pull out these raspberries and will, I mean, I know they grow, you know, and they do their thing underground. Am I going to have to do something closer to the raspberries to keep them from coming up? Or do you think it was just seeds falling or? Um, it, they stolen they out and they spread all by themselves without the seeds. Oh. Um, and it's very common. That's how come people give you raspberries because uh, everybody's got raspberries and here comes ones you don't want. It's hard. It's just like thinning vegetable seeds. It's so hard to pull out something that's living that you actually planted. Mm -hmm. But um, unless you want to put raspberry starts on your driveway and have people take them away, just pull them out. That that's about the only thing you're you're going to be able to do. I know where your raspberries are, and I, I that can be an issue. But yeah. Just just pull them. Okay. And if it's thinning, if your stand of raspberries is thinning, replant them in between some of the bare spots, and just keep keep it generating. Great. Thank you. Sure. One thing I want to add is watering, and I talked about it a little bit, but not not enough. Um, many plants, like I said before, it is a, it's an environmental issue uh, more than insects or diseases. But if you wonder if you've watered enough, water like you always do, and, and then when you're done and you think you're done, dig down and see how far down that water went. If you've got a lot of mulch, you may be just watering the first half inch of the mulch and not the plant. Um, that one of the reasons too is that when you're mulching, don't put it, even though this maybe sounds backwards, don't put it thicker where the root system is, where the trunk is, because when you water, you want it to go down. Uh, yes, it helps retain, the mulch helps retain water, but it also gets dried out and you can water and water and water and water and it's just not doing it. So to know that you're getting down to where the root system is, is really important. And the easiest way to do that is to water slowly. I mean, it's really fun in the summer to watch people in their yard just stand there with the hose and go back and forth. And likely their plants aren't getting very much water at all. So same thing with pots. That's why you want the water to drip out the bottom. Dan? Sure. I have a question. Um, each year I start off really well with my squash plants and then they get, I can't keep down the powdery mildew. Anything that I should do before I plant to help out? I wish, I wish, because yeah. it is an issue. Uh, they're really hard to grow without uh, having the mildew and it, it depends on the weather again every, every year 
of whether or not we've had really warm nights or moisture. Um, my husband used to say, uh, it's like a three-legged stool. If you've got the right plant and the right environment and the right, um, everything is perfect for that mildew, you're not gonna be able to do it. I, sometimes I've had luck removing every mildewed leaf and then the new growth, maybe the weather changes a little bit and the new growth comes out, you might get two more zucchinis than you would have otherwise. Uh, but it is an issue. Same thing with uh, uh, leaf blights and other things that happen in the summer, tomato blights. And um, some years it's just worse, much worse than others. I'm sure there's products that say it helps, but I'm not sure that it really does. There are some transplant products um, that you can, that are available in nurseries. And Ray used to say that, um, uh, are you sure it's the vitamin B in it or the water that you're just putting on the plant? So with it, so if you water, uh, that's probably what's making your plant survive. Um, just for those of you who don't know, my husband Ray passed away two and a half years ago and he was the county agent for 32 years here in, in Portland and, uh, and we both managed the Master Gardener program in Oregon. Um, him for 19 years and me for, I don't know, 10, 15, I don't know. Anyway, and he taught, we taught in 19 counties in Oregon every year for Master Gardener training and so every Everything I know about uh, horticulture, I would hang around him like a sponge, trying to learn as much as I possibly could. So um, the other the other one that I remember uh, is uh, is that if you're using insecticidal soap on uh, a plant, say that has aphids, um, you have to have the aphid or the insect present because if it's not, Ray used to say that, um, that aphid is just gonna get clean feet when it walks by later instead of killing the, the aphid. So uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm a conglomerate of two people in the horticulture industry. <laughs> so, well, have you guys got any more questions? You know, and you brought up, um, I'm just gonna say, since she brought this up, I just wanted you all to see that um, Jan is also an author with her um, late husband. And I found this book that she penned, Book of Lists, really helpful in putting in a new garden last um, summer. So I just, I, and, and I had someone come um, over who was a gardener to help me pick plums. And he was telling me about his garden. And he was telling me about this Book of Lists that he had just found somehow, some way on Amazon, and he was describing it. And I said, that's Jan's book. <laughs> so anyway, if you're, you know, in the process of putting in a new garden, it's just really, really a helpful book. And so I just wanted to plug that. Yeah, since you we were wrote that in 1997. And I'm still, I got an, another royalty check yesterday. <laughs> they don't sell as many. We don't have when you're in 19 counties teaching master gardeners, we used to sell them by the case because every place we went every year, we would sell a whole bunch of books. Uh, okay. It was fun to write. We wrote it on, on the road uh, as such. Uh, we, I would teach three hours in the morning or afternoon and Ray would teach the other three hours. And the three hours we weren't teaching, we were with a computer writing that book. So we got the contract in February and we were, we printed in, in, in August, so it didn't take us too long, but uh, it's, it's been fun. A lot of people get t two copies, one to keep in the car and get dirty when they're at the nursery and the other one for home. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was fun to do. And Ray also wrote another book before that, uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, Gar guide home gardening, which was all about fruit trees and vegetables. And it's not in print anymore, but yeah, it's also, it's on Amazon and it's also on Kindle that you can oh. on Amazon as well. Sally, did you have something? I do. I have a couple questions. Okay. The first question I have is, so 
very new gardeners. We, we planted two, we had two raised beds last year for the first time. And um, so my first question is we had, we, we did this as an experiment last year. And so learned a lot of lessons like spacing. <laughs> oh, wow. Did we learn from that? Um, one of my questions has to do with tomatoes because we noticed that the larger tomatoes, I don't know the technical terms for this, so, but they didn't form all the way on the bottom and they just looked, not that they just didn't form, but they were brown and really ugly looking on the bottom. I don't know the technical term for it. It's like they didn't close and they just looked. There's like several diseases actually that tomatoes can get. Uh, there's a cat facing where it literally has lines almost like a, oh, I'm trying to think of the disease for potatoes. Um, and there's also the blossom end rot, which will actually, the base of it where the blossom was will turn black or brown. And the other thing um, is sun, sun scald. It's pretty common to end up with a, a tomato that's it's the one that's on the outside of the plant towards the hottest part of the day. And sometimes you can get sun scald as well. Um, the, the late blight and early blight for tomatoes, you, there are some things you can do. There are some fungicides, uh, if indeed that's what you have. But that would be what you need to figure out first is what it really was. Okay. That was my first thing. Okay. Uh, put uh, If you're going to put tomatoes in, make sure you put some calcium in the bottom of the uh, of the hole and that will because the calcium the lack of calcium is why that end turns black so either way uh -huh. uh, whether you know what it is or not it's not going to hurt for you to do that this year okay excellent thank you and then the second question I had was um, do you have a preference for the fertilizer that you would use for um, maybe in general but really the form so we have you know, hanging pots that have all kinds of flowers, but we also have potted plants that are more reachable, you know, more on the ground. And I was just curious to know if you have a preference for the fertilizer that is in the form of sticks that are delayed release, or that you would actually put in maybe something that you would use, maybe a watering can. I just didn't know if you had a preference. The sticks are pretty much worthless. Um, oh, good to know. Uh, well, it's just that in a, a liquid form fertilizer, it's going to get to all the roots in there. And then the sticks, and people use them for trees too, fertilizer stakes. Um, it's just, it's better to, it's up to you how you want to do it. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to reach up and have water down your arm every time you uh, you have a hanging basket, you can use the, the fertilizer like Osmocote that I showed you that's a release every time you, um, you water. Um, and so you don't have to, uh, you don't have to put liquid fertilizer in. Sometimes the pots that you have, you could do the same thing with Osmocote. I like to use a, um, sort of a slow release organic uh, fertilizer that will give micronutrients and everything um, at one time every time you every time you water it's the it's the water it, it's all in the water <laughs> even if you don't have any fertilizer and you water your plant's going to do better than if if you didn't and so they things dry out so quickly and and then there you are in september thinking do i still have to water it's going to rain right and now and this year um, we had to keep watering for quite a long time because anything that's stressed from lack of water um, in the fall is not going to do well in a winter that might be stressful. So, because it's already going in to the winter stressed. Um, so there again, it's just a, uh, trying to set up a routine that's going to work and it's going to be different every year. Thank you. Sure. I do know, I, I do have one other thing. I do know that there's a really amazing community garden opportunity if people didn't want to, or in addition to 
you know, working in their own gardens. I know there's an amazing community garden opportunity that maybe someone might want to mention. Oh, yes. Yeah, what do you know? There was a fundraiser for that this weekend, right? Maybe. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Hi, Sally. Yep. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, Jan, I think you met Susan yesterday. I did. You said that, yeah, you guys chatted a while, so that's great. Um, so she might have told you what we're trying to do, but um, yeah, so the Ruth Hafner Plaza, it's a, it's a local neighborhood sort of public housing for seniors and those with disabilities and, um, you know, I've, I've come to get to know some of the residents and um, uh, through some other projects we've been doing with them. We did a, a holiday care package for them in December, and then we did a, a cleaning supply donation drive for them this past March. And the and so the plaza had sort of come to me and said, hey, we're looking for um, to build a community garden because since COVID um, in the complex, they haven't had any community space, all the kitchen area, all the space where they'd go to, you know, mingle together, you know, was, was closed. So um, they, you know, they were interested in, in, in seeing if, if the any neighbors wanted to put together a community garden. And so I put out my feelers and met with Susan or, you know, got connected with Susan, Susan, um, uh, Schlesinger, Schlesinger, excuse me, I'm probably butchering that. I'm sorry, Susan, I know you're going to watch this. <laughs> um, who's a master gardener and has done community gardens um, uh, recently in Chicago. So she has just been a, a rock star, amazing person. She's, we've recently put up the beds. We made two beds, one um, ADA accessible and another one um, that's on the ground using the um, Hugel garden approach. Um, which I know wasn't mentioned here, but uh, it's been a it's been an interesting process to learn. Um, you know, where we're sort of layering different elements um, to make a, a rich soil, and Susan's been breaking her back literally <laughs> to make this happen for the Ruth Hafner Plaza. And so we're kind of at a point where uh, we've got the beds made. We're really trying to make it ADA accessible. We've got a lot of residents who have um, wheelchairs, and so. Um, I'll plop my email into the uh, chat here, and if you're interested in, um, you know, um, we're, we're, we're kind of at a phase where we've built the beds, you know, we're always looking for more soil. Susan would love to Uh-oh. We lost her. Well, we know how to contact her. <laughs> yeah, it's there. <laughs> Susan, if you are there and you could finish up what Ashley might be saying, that'd be great. But maybe I she think was... What Susan's doing right now, just so you know, because I don't think she's available right now. She was intermittently trying to listen. And uh, Susan is a neighbor of mine. And she, what they're doing right now is she is doing a, a plant sale. Um, she has lots and lots and lots of different types of plants, veggies, trees, that type of thing, and she is selling them from her driveway um, for a, you know, suggested donation that is going directly to that project that Ashley was just talking about at the Ruth, Ruth Hefner Plaza for that community garden, and I think Susan has stepped away because she's trying to deal with the sale of the plants and helping people. Well, I, I got rid of a bunch of them for her yesterday. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, she did the same thing last year. It was unbelievable. And she did it um, not for Ruth Hefner, but she did it for the um, Oregon Food Bank. I can't even remember how many thousands of dollars she did. Um, oh, she said four, I think four thousand. Four thousand dollars. Yeah, it was just it was Amazing. incredible, very generous. And so now she uh, chose a different organization this year. So anyway, very. You know, it, just, it just reminds me too, it just this with this group we have here, it's, you know, we always can remember that the fruits of our labors don't have to just end at our kitchen table. You know, um, yes, you know, like um, if you have starts, 
Um, you know, I know that they're probably, you know, that like Susan's using them to generate funds for this project. But if you have starts and you don't need them all, I know that, um, for example, the neighborhood house food pantry garden is looking for starts. Um, and they also are asking if you do have extra produce in your garden at the end of, you know, a season to bring it over to them. They take produce over at the neighborhood house food pantry. And I'm sure in other neighborhoods, there are other food pantries that take produce too. Um, there also is the um, Portland Fruit Tree Project. And, um, you know, they will um, potentially do some of the picking of the fruit of your fruit trees and then get them to people who are um, struggling with food insecurity. So um, I think just, you know, we're gar you know, as we garden, there are always other people who could use our um, extras. And um, yeah, so Ashley's back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> finish up what you were saying. <laughs> Oh, uh, I was just sending a little, putting in the chat, but yeah, sorry about that, everybody. I, my, my laptop ran out of batteries. Um, uh. But uh, yeah, just to, just to close, um, thank you for the opportunity to introduce the project. Um, you know, we're at a phase where we're probably just looking for time. Anybody wants to come give some elbow grease or donations to help make, um, you know, sort of an ADA accessible uh, uh, foundation for, for uh, the garden and um, also veggie starts. I know this is a good time to be asked for that. So um, if you have any extras, uh, I will put my email back in the chat. And then also, I know Susan also has. Um, nope. I have 24 black crim starts out of my greenhouse. So I'll get you some. Oh, awesome. All right, great. Thank you. And also, so Susan's also. Um, don't have an attachment to send, but she's still doing some, she's, she's doing a plant sale. It does end today, but I'm sure we, if, you know, if you're interested in learning what she's got, um, we could um, email me and I can send you that list of plants she has. She's got some really beautiful options and, and so would take donations for, for those. Yeah. I actually have it, um, Ashley. I'm just looking for it right now. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I think it's a PDF. So sure yeah, got I've got it. Thank you. Yeah, she's got some amazing to do some starts, but this year I have all shade. I don't have any sunshine, so I don't have an option to do starts this year. I was really sad. No oh. veggies for me. <laughs> oh, no. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Here it is. Oh, yeah, thanks. Perfect. Yeah, look at all that good stuff. Yeah, she has a great uh, variety of a lot of different things. Yeah, so feel free to um, shoot me an email if you want a copy of this list and want to get a hold of Susan um, and what she has, but um, also if you're interested in, yeah, helping us make uh, make this community garden happen. I think it's going to be, um, and we've got a lot of residents who have come out and are, you know, to their ability helping us. Um, I think we've did a lot of the, the bigger, um, heavier work. Um, so now we're getting into the fun planting work. So I think um, it's getting exciting. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all so much for being here and a hearty, hearty thank you to Jan for sharing your wisdom with us. Just um, and no problem. really, really um, always learn something new. And um, you know, what you're doing is seriously planting serious seeds. And, you know, having the, um, you know, this idea of, you know, teaching the fishermen how to fish rather than <laughs> anything else. So we thank you for everything you give us. I'll be here. Okay. Very nice. And You're I think I welcome. see Frankie there. He's a celebrity. Hi, Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> we saw that Frankie helped to deliver the er, um, Blanchet House goodies on Wednesday. Yeah. You remember that? 
Your prior shades. <laughs> you see the. <laughs> yeah, he's my little helper. He's my little little, little sidekick. <laughs> oh. oh, there's Susan. Your Hi. ears. Oh. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, I look like this, but I came in for some coffee, and I saw you're still going. Yeah. <laughs> just finishing. Hi, Jan. Hi. <laughs> This, yeah. is, this is just so fun. I can't wait to watch the whole program. Thank you for doing this. It was really great. It was really great. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Frankie. Hi. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Susan, we just gave, I gave a little, just a little, um, yeah, just a little info, in, in, info about what we're trying to do. And um, I don't know if you have anything more to say about what we're, we're trying to make, but I uh, gave my email if anybody's interested in helping with time, money, donations, veggie starts. Yeah, well, it'll be it'll be interesting uh, because uh, everybody would love to plant a garden, and it's tough work up front, and then it's fun for a while, and then we might be growing things that um, folks don't like, and if there's leftovers, there's plenty of places we can take that, but we might need some help. We we plan on um, kind of having a sharing stand. If we have too many tomatoes, um, they can just pick and put on the stand and then with their free for other residents who aren't involved in the in the project. One of the, the difficulties is um, ownership of a community garden is really important because if people help with it, they'll stick with it. Uh, but there's also kind of a territorial aspect that we have to deal with, um, with folks who may put in the work and then somebody stops by and they would like a tomato and then they think that's unfair. So they are gonna have their issues to work out. But this little sharing stand might help with that. And I, I believe we'll have plenty of stuff for everybody to share. Um, but it's a learning process this year and it's a great opportunity to get them together. And I, I'm really happy because like, I just had a neighbor couple who were doing their yard and look what they just gave me. Huh? Oh, wow! Right. From this young couple, and it's uh -huh. just um, it's amazing. So yeah. this is really good work. It's hard. We we still need some funds to build the the bed around to make the bed ADA um, safe. But we're we're on the right track, and I appreciate anybody's help for harvesting or delivering food if there's extra surplus for plant starts. If anybody has anything, would be great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Thank you so much. Next, I'm go up. back outside. We're yeah. almost done. But come on by if you want any plants. We still have some. Cross Street from Bridal Mile Elementary. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Okay. Appreciate it all. You're Bye. welcome. Anytime. Thanks,